Today is a mailbag edition of the Locked on Penguins podcast. We are going to answer some of your questions for this episode right after this. Your Locked on Penguins. Your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am one of your hosts, Hunter Hodes. That is my co-host, Patrick Damp. You can follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. You can follow Pat's Twitter at Cinnamon for Wet. And you can follow the show's Twitter at LNS for Penguins, of course. Thank you all so much for making this your first listen slash watch of the day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. You can make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. So we had over 20 questions submitted by you amazing listeners. Thank you all so much for sending in these questions for this mailbag. This will probably be, I think, Pat, part one of potential, you know, a two-parter coming in on Monday, maybe Wednesday of next week. But we just had some really good questions. We're not going to be able to get to every question today, but we're certainly going to try our best. Starting things off, a question from King Clarkie on Penguins Twitter. Predictions. Who ends the season with more points, Eric Carlson or Sidney Crosby? And how many points does each end up with? I'm going to start with this one. I'm going to go 105 for Sidney Crosby. We kind of discussed that on the Wednesday episode with just how he can maybe hit 100 again. I have him at 105 just because, again, I think he's going to produce a little bit more on the power play. I think five on five, especially when Jake Gensel comes back, I think he's going to have a renaissance year. I think that's going to play a big part in Sid getting to over 100. With Carlson, I'm going to say he gets, throw out a random number, I'm going to go with about 83. I think he's going to be a little over a point per game player. He's not going to hit 100 like he did this past season, but I still think he's going to be at over point per game. He will be the highest scoring defenseman on the team this season. So those are my predictions for Carlson and Crosby. I have, Car- I have Crosby beating him out by a little over 20 points. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I would say I think Carlson's probably going to do a little better. I think he's probably going to get somewhere in the 90s uh, this year just because of power play time and just the fact that he's going to have a lot more talent around him in Pittsburgh than he did last year in – San Jose, but I think last year was kind of, I don't want to say an outlier just because you put up a hundred points, you're a Norris winner. He's always been consistently great offensively, but I think having more talent around him is going to be both a blessing and a curse. You know, you look, you, one of my favorite things to watch cause I'm a very predictable nerd is the Penguins 50th anniversary documentary And I always think back to what they said in that for the 2013 season where they flamed out against the Bruins. There's only so much puck to go around. And part of the reason he scored so much in San Jose was because it was pretty much him and maybe two other guys. Comes Pittsburgh, it's going to be him and four or five other guys. So he's going to factor in an offense a lot, but I don't think it's always going to be in the form of goals and points. It's going to be in the form of possession. It's going to be in the form of breaking the puck out of the zone, the first touch that doesn't always lead to a secondary assist. So for him, I got him in about the 90 range. As for Sid, the more I think about it after our episode earlier this week, I think he's going to have an incredible year. I I just, it feels that way, especially because we talk about it here. I've written about it. It taught it's get talked to death about in Sid's career it just seems like every time you start to kind of doubt him, he gives you a proverbial middle finger. Like I think he could be in the 110, 115 range this year just because, again, a lot of talent, assuming he stays healthy. I mean, he he's poised, I don't want to say for a breakout because he's a consistently great to elite player, but I think there's a chance he puts up triple digits this year. I, I think he will but put up triple digits this year. Again, with all the reasons that we discussed in our earlier episode this week and for today for Carlson, I guess I have him a little below 90 because him and Latang are kind of, I think going to be splitting up those minutes 
at five on five. He's not going to be the quote unquote guy for the Penguins like he was with the Sharks because, again, you know, we've talked about this to death, I think, at this point, Pat. He was the Sharks' offense when he was on the ice. I mean, Timo Meyer for a good part of the season, was a lot of their offense too because before he got traded in New Jersey. Tomas Hurdle was also pretty good during the season as well. But when Carlson was on the ice, he was the one generating offense. And he won't be on the ice maybe as often as he was when he was with the Sharks. So I think that may bring him down a little bit. But still, I have him at overall point per game. He's going to have a really good year again. I just think with Sid and just five on five, I think that's going to put him over the edge. And also he may have some more points when Carlson is not out there because I also think there's a chance that Evgeny Malkin bogs up Carlson because he usually – Usually it's been throughout their careers, Crosby's the one that gets Latang. And then when Crosby's gotten hurt, Malkin gets him. Now it'll be crazy to see what Mike Sullivan decides to do. I still think for the most part, Crosby's gonna get Latang and then Malkin's gonna get Carlson. So with that, I do expect Crosby to get some more points with Latang, which will put him over the edges, you know, over Carlson. Yeah, and I think what you said there too is another reason for my thought of Carlson kind of regressing so to speak points wise because he probably will see a little bit less ice time in Pittsburgh since he'll be on the second pair if if you can call a pairing with Eric Carlson the second but yeah overall I think he sees a little bit of a drop from 100 but not by a lot I agree yeah it's not going to be like this I don't think a 35 40 point drop I think if anything again it's you know, 15, 16, 18, somewhere in that range. Next question for the mailbag. This comes from Chell Penguins. What do you think about the Penguins power play this year? Would you run Carlson and Latang on the same one? And my answer to that is yes, I would. I know some people would rather have Latang and Carlson run their own units, but I think the Penguins are better on their first unit when both of them are on there. You can put out just even more talent with both of them on there compared to one being on the first unit and one being on the second unit. You can have Crosby, who's the best player behind in the net, and I mean, arguably the best in league history down there because he's just his vision is so good. Of getting Malkin, you could put on the right half wall. His one timer is among the best in the league. Carlson's very good at moving the puck around the blue line. He's also very good at breaking the puck into the offensive zone on the power play. You can have a net front presence in Jake Gensel. Very underrated net front presence, I think, around the league. And then you can put Chris Letang in that Phil Kessel spot. And we've talked about this so much. The Penguins have not had a player like Kessel on the power play since he left. And I'm not – look, I'm not comparing Chris Letang to Phil Kessel here. They are two completely different players. I'm just saying, skill sets-wise, on the power play, it's a bit similar because Letang can obviously rip the puck really well and we all know how great of a passer he is on the power play. So I think that spot will suit him a little bit better. I would absolutely run both of those defensemen on the power play. And also, in a way, it helps prevent shorthanded goal opportunities because usually the Penguins, they like running one defenseman on the top power play with Latang. Now you have two. And sure, Eric Carlson's not known for his defense, but you still got two defensemen out there. Yeah, and we saw it this past season. Regardless of your thoughts on the way the NHL runs the standings, every point is precious. So load up. Take every opportunity you can to win a game from start to finish. And if that means putting your five best players on the on the top power play unit and keeping them together, you do that. Plus, another, you know, this kind of circles back to the first question – This is a chance to really run an ideal power play for the Penguins because you know who will benefit a lot from having both Carlson and Letang on the power play? Sidney Crosby. You can put him in that behind the goal line in front of the net spot that he loves to play and is most effective when they have a man advantage. You would have Letang and Gino, like you said, on the half walls. You would have Carlson up top. Gensel in front when he's healthy and then Crosby basically being a second quarterback down low on the power play, which if you ask me, in my opinion, that's your ideal lineup and everybody in their ideal spot. 
because it plays to all of their strengths perfectly. Gino, when he gets in that soft spot for the one timer, deadly. Chris Letang being able to work the puck around from the half wall, very, very talented. We've all seen what Eric Carlson can do up top and Jake Gensel in front may not be the biggest guy, but he's shifty enough to play there and to create uh, chances from the soft spot, which again works to Sid's advantage because he's going to be able to find them there when everybody's paying attention to Crosby down low, which opens up that slot area in front for Jake Gensel. That's that perfect little TJ Oshi area that he used to always kill the Penguins at. That's like that slot area, you know, 10, 15, almost 20 feet out from the net. It's where Oshi always killed them. And if Jake can you know, be right there too, I mean, he'll score plenty of goals, I think. On the and, top. and think about this too. All that talent on one unit, who do you pick to defend? Because if you leave any of them open, they're a threat. Right. Leave Jake Gensel open in front, natural goal scorer. He's going to find a way to score. Leave Crosby unattended behind the net. He's going to find a way to work the puck to the guys who are open. Leave Gino open for a one-timer. We've seen him nearly turn goaltenders into dust with that shot. Leave Eric Carlson or Chris Letang unattended. <laughs> Good luck. Right. And, heck, they also, if they wanted to, you could switch Carlson and Letang spots. You could put Letang at the point. He knows how to quarterback it. And if you want Eric Carlson to rip shots from that half ball, he'll gladly do it. And he has great vision from over there, too. So and, you can make your poison. And with those five. There is no better substitute for a power play than movement in zone. Mm -hmm. Power plays get stagnant when you stop moving. When everybody says, no, this is my spot. I stay here. I don't go anywhere else. You put those five together and get them in some kind of cyclical movement throughout the offensive zone. Then it becomes a chaos of motion that's going to be incredibly hard for penalty kills to, uh, to counter. Yeah, I just want them to be a little more aggressive on the power play this upcoming season. And again, there's no excuses for Todd Reardon now. I mean, this is this is... Kind of make or break for him at this point. If you can't get something out of this unit, you might be finding yourself maybe a new job or just having your power play duties stripped. Because I know he's the associate you know, coach right now, but you can't make this unit work. I don't think you're going to be the power play coach anymore. That's for sure. But that will do it for this segment. Coming up in the second segment, we're going to get to more of your mailbag questions. Still a lot more fun ones to get to. But before we discuss that, we have to dive into... FanDuel football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is giving you the chance to win all season long. Right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time they win in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you'll get bonus bets for every win. You can use these bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more. So you can visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel, the official partner of of the NFL and locked on. All right, we're back here in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am Hunter Hodes, joined by my co-host, Patrick Damp. So kicking things off for the second segment, we have a question from Jackson Hollister who asks, I know this is way too early for trade deadline talk, but with our current cap situation, how do they go about adding, assuming they are in a position to add and no one is on LTIR, do you have a prediction for who would be moved in a money in, money out scenario? That is a great question, honestly, because we know the Penguins are going to be right up against the cap during the regular season. It would have to be money in, money out. I think that's the only way they're going to have to do this. I think... I, it's it's t it's tricky to answer this question because the players who they have on the team right now are all very solid. Now, if you're looking at money in, money out, I hate throwing this name out there, but I have to. If he struggles, Brian Rust, I mean, he's up there in age. He has quite a few years left on that contract. It makes over $5 million. If he struggles to rebound this year, I could see the Penguins moving him out. They may have to retain some salary to get someone back. So I could see that. Other players on the roster, maybe someone else in the bottom six. I, mean, I don't know if they're going to deal like a Matt Nieto or something like that, or maybe some of these other guys who they signed over the offseason to these cheap deals. I think they would maybe be in contention, but I don't think you're going to see someone like Marcus Pedersen get moved or anything like that. I mean, Brian Russ is really the main one that comes to mind, I think. Because, you know, when I look up and down this roster, Pat, there really isn't much where I'm like, hmm, Money in, money out in terms of players who could struggle. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to say Drew O'Connor because he's going to get a full look this year. 
who do you have in that scenario? Brian Rust is definitely up there. He has a no move, so it's a little tough. The one thing I keep in mind, too, when questions like this come around is a lot of guys outside of the core three aren't Kyle Dubas acquisitions or signings. So there is no real loyalty there. It's not that to say that he doesn't like the player. It's not to say that they aren't good players. But keep in mind, this is outside of a handful of players. This is not a totally a Kyle Dubas constructed team yet. So, you know, a Brian Rust is a good candidate, you know, five, one, two, five, but that goes through the next few years. So that's going to be a little hard to move, especially if he struggles, because it's really hard to move a five million dollar contract for someone that's not producing. But at the same time, I think he's due for a big bounce back. He just had an unlucky season last year. The main name that comes up to me is Marcus Patterson. If you want, and I know Kyle Dubas likes him, doesn't want to move him out, but it's, you know, just a $4 million deal. It's got one year after this left. So that's enticing to other general managers. It could probably get you some good return, especially if POJ and Ty Smith actually start to show some promise at the NHL level and you have some good replacements for them. But yeah, I mean, that's the bad, that's going to be the, that's the other thing with this question is, there's nobody right now on the roster that you look at and go, oof, like that's somebody left that we should get rid of. So, you know, that's not even me saying it's a great team. There's definitely some improvements they need to make. But overall, like, I don't know who you move yet. We got to see how the season plays out. We also don't know, on the other hand, there's always a team or two that you expected to be good or competitive that ends up having a rough year. And they might be looking to hit the rebuild button. So we'll we'll see. But for me, it's Marcus Pedersen or Brian Rust or two guys you would actively look to move if you had the chance, especially if you wanted to, say, get a scoring winger in the bottom six or somebody to fill out the defense. Right. And I didn't want to say Marcus Pedersen. I mean, I mean it's, it's an obvious one, but I just don't want them to move him because – you think about it. He's one, I think he's one of the most underrated defensemen in the league. His underlyings are tremendous. He ranked in over the 85th percentile this past season for five on five even strength offense and five on five even strength defense. You just don't move that kind of player, especially when he's only making four million per. He's on an absolute steal of a contract. I mean, only way I would maybe do it is if you're getting just a bona fide like top line winger coming back. Or something like that, but even then, I, I don't think that's going to be up the Penguins' wheelhouse this upcoming season, just because of how good their top six is heading into the year. But yeah, those are definitely the two main ones for dollar in, dollar out. Other ways, I mean, they they would have to create cap space, but again, there's not really a lot of bad contracts outside of Jeff Carter, and this is his last year of his contract before he sails off into the sunset. Next question: This comes from Chad Hess. Is a Phil Kessel acquisition plausible? Good old Phil the Thrill. I knew this one was coming from someone. Phil comes into the year coming off a 14-goal, 36-point campaign for the Golden Knights. Helped win hit them his – well, he helped win them their first Stanley Cup. He won his third Stanley Cup overall. Only played in a few games during the run. He's 35 years old right now. Had a decent year. 12 of his 14 goals were at even strength. But as much as I love him, I think it's probably time you move on. It would be fun seeing him come back on a PTO. You get the vibes going to see if he can make the team out of camp. He probably would because it's Phil Kessel. But I think at this point with how the roster is constructed, how there's also plenty of older players already, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I, I will always cherish the memories that Kessel had with the Penguins. He was tremendous in 2016 of the HEPK line. He was awesome in 2017. He was awesome after that before he got traded to Arizona. But he is not the same player anymore. And it's been shown, especially over the past couple of years. I would pass, in my opinion. I would love it for the story. I would love it for just the general vibe because he's such a great locker room guy in such a great character, but it's just, they're gunning for a Stanley cup. And I know a bunch of people are gonna say he just won it with Vegas, but he wasn't that much of a contributor outside of a locker room presence for some of the younger guys. The time has passed. Unfortunately, uh, I wish they never would have traded him in the first place because 
he was still very productive when they traded him. He was still very much in a position where he was going to be productive and a goal scorer for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And because Jim Rutherford had to go ahead and Jim Rutherford it up, they got rid of him. So I wish it, it would be fun for the memories, but I don't think it would be great for the, the stated goal of winning a Stanley Cup. I agree. Again, it's always fun thinking about getting the band back together. One last hurrah, all that stuff. But I think right now, you know, the Penguins goal is to win the cup either this season or just, you know, future season, whatever. I just don't think he's like that missing piece that he was back in 2016 and 2017. So again, and who, and who knows, like, maybe, maybe one day down the road, especially since his sister works here, he decides to sign a one day contract and retire as a Pittsburgh Penguin. Took the words right out of my mouth. I was, I was, I figured you were about to say that, but I was like, yeah, maybe he retires a member of the Penguins or something like that. But everyone will always remember what he did here. It's just now is not the time, I think, to bring him back. One more question before we head to a break. This comes from Kyle from Penguins Twitter. Is there any way it's funny? Uh, he's, he's talking about Kyle Dubas and his name is Kyle. So I, I absolutely love that. He goes, is there any way Kyle Dubas will go into sell mode over the course of the big three's remaining contracts or will he always be going for it? I only think the Penguins sell if they're truly bad. And I mean flat out bad. Bottom 10, especially bottom five. If they are anything but a bottom five or bottom 10 team, you will see him continue to try to buy or I guess tinker with the team. You are not going to see him sell just for the sake of selling. Now, if this season just goes off the rails, goes down the drain that are way worse than everyone expects them to, then yeah, I could see him selling a little bit at the deadline or same for next year. But right now, I don't really see him selling at all throughout the big three's remaining contracts. I think he's going to be continuing to go for it for as long as Crosby, Malkin, Latang, and especially now Carlson are playing at elite levels. Yeah, this might extend this segment a little bit longer than it needs to be, but a couple things on this one. I think Kyle here is asking two different kind of questions. Uh, the only way, like you said, he goes into sell mode is if this team is truly awful. And, and like, does I'm talking worst case scenario of the worst case scenario of the worst case scenario. So that's the only way I see a sell happening. One thing I will say, there is a scenario in which I can see this kind of ha happening in a way during the big threes time, big four now that you have Carlson. Let's say this season just, goes completely off the rails and they are bad. They're bottom of the division near the bottom of the conference, not looking like they'll have a playoff season. I could see him selling just about everybody that isn't named Crosby, Malkin, Latang, or Carlson and just saying, you know what? I'm hitting the full reset button with these, with, with these four and I'm going to build around them. I'm going to sell Gensel. I'm going to sell rust. I'm going to sell Pedersen and I'm with the cap, skyrocketing next or skyrocketing relatively because it's the national hockey league the cap going up he'll go into that free agency and go i'm going to make trades i'm going to make signings i'm going to completely retool this roster top to bottom and do a frame off restoration of the franchise where he keeps his big names and does everything else around them and for the last part as long as crosby malkin and Latang are productive yeah you go for it you absolutely go for it you get a fourth banner in the in the rafters with those those guys. Who cares what happens at the end? You hit that immortality stage at that point when you have four banners. Like you're already legends right now with those big three with three Stanley Cups. You hit four, that's that immortality stage. Like no one, yep. no, no one can say anything about you right now. I mean, no one should at least. You get four no one better dare say, any, say anything about you. That's for sure. But I mean, you can also throw Raquel in there too. If you want to sell him off, if the season goes off the rails too. And Pat, I'll just say this. They'll have a lot of cap space next summer too, to really just revamp that team around that core four. I, I mean, they're going to, they're going to have cap space this, yeah. this next off season, no matter what, but you know, should this season, hopefully it doesn't, but should this season go off the rails, there's a scenario where Dubas maximizes that by selling just about everybody that isn't the big four. And you will, you'll definitely get some really good returns for those players. That, that's for sure. But that'll do it for this segment. Coming up after this, we have a few more questions to end this mailbag edition of the Locked on Penguins podcast. So stick around for that. Coming up 
right after this. All right, we're back here in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am Hunter Hodes. That is Patrick Damp. This is a question here. This person asks, if you could bring back two wingers from any team post-1990, one for Crosby and one for Malkin, given their play styles, who would you pick? This is such a fun question. Yeah, shout out to my buddy John. He, he was Him and I played in-house might league together in 1996. <laughs> That's awesome. Man, it, this is such a tough one because like, I, I feel like you could go, man. I know, my Crosby, I know my first one for Crosby. I have one too, and it's Alex Ovechkin. That's I th- that's mine for. I think for, he means. I will say. I think he means penguins, like guys uh, who played for the penguins. Oh, if, oh, because I thought he said like any winger or something like that. I so, think it's it's two wingers from like the penguins uh, history. So the one I would have for Sid is my all time favorite penguin because he would be a better Chris Kunitz, and that's Kevin Stevens. Give me Kevin Stevens on Crosby's wing and watch them both put up 150 points. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, because I, th- I, th- I thought it said any team post-1990, so my brain went, oh, any NHL team? Let's just put Alex Ovechkin in there. But if we're just talking strictly Penguins here, for Crosby, man, I don't know. Seeing – whew, this is tough. Seeing him in Yager would be a lot of fun, but I'd also maybe put him with Gino considering their play styles. See, that's who I was going to go with for Gino. Yeah. Is, is if you could have prime or even going into his prime Yags with Malkin, oh my God, would that yeah. connection be electric? Because they both, in a way, play similar st- played, played and play similar styles in the sense that they just use their big frames to just get around people and shield the puck, that it would be like those videos you would see of Datsuk back in the day where people just couldn't get the puck off of them because people would just be like, oh my God, these two are just so big. What do I do? <laughs> right. Yeah, I- I'm going to I'm gonna go Yager for Malkin. You had Ron- – you had – no, I almost said Ron Francis. You had Kevin Stevens for Crosby. I'm going to go Marion Hosa. I know he was only around for a little bit, but the chemistry they had together was absolutely unreal toward the late stages of the 2008 season and into the playoffs. I just thinking about them playing for multiple years together, had he stayed in Pittsburgh, the amount of points that Hosa and Crosby would have together would have been unbelievable. With how Hosa's release was, he's also one heck of a playmaker, but that release was something else. Sign me up for multiple seasons of Marion Hosa playing next to Sidney Crosby. Dude, and you remember that 2008 run to the final? They slept walked through the Eastern Conference. Yes. They swept Ottawa. They beat the Rangers in five, and then they beat the Flyers in five. They played 14 games on the way to the Stanley Cup final. And the only reason they didn't win was because that was a stacked Detroit team. Right. I mean, I will always say that Red Wings team is easily by far the best of the salary cap era. I mean, I don't think that's a debate. And and not to disparage 2009, but let's be real here. They had no business beating them again in 2009. Like that should have been a back-to-back Detroit Cup. And just because they got a couple of huge saves from Flurry in a couple different games, they just snuck away with that Stanley Cup. Oh, 100%. I mean, that game seven when they were holding on for dear life in the third period. I remember I was watching that game. I'm like, they get the goal, make it 2-1. And I'm like, I am just waiting for the Red Wings to tie this game because all the Penguins were doing, sky hooking it out, dumping it down past a little bit to the red line at center ice. And they, oh, the Red Wings would come right back into the offensive zone. And that's like, it will repeat itself. And I'm like, it, Please, can this talk, can the clock tick down? Faster, go faster. It's, it's a it's a loose comparison, but it very much was the 1980 U.S. team against the Soviets. They were just like, we don't need to score. Just, just don't let them score. <laughs> they didn't even like make a play almost for the empty net. They were just like, we are being hemmed in on their own zone so bad. We're just going to collapse the net and make sure Mark andre Fleury doesn't allow anything through. And that shot from the Ooh. crossbar from um, 
was it uh was it eric's oh, no it was erickson or cronwall which one was it um, it was one of the two but it, it, yeah. it, hit, it hit the crossbar and it yes. was like at, like you could feel all of the blood pressure across western pennsylvania spike in that moment yeah it, yes yeah yeah you're right i mean that i remember that shot man it was I think I, I literally almost collapsed to the ground because I was so nervous there. But yeah, I was blanking on which one it was because one of them scored the goal and then the other one hit the crossbar there. So I, I believe it was actually Erickson that scored it and then Cronwall hit uh, the pipe. So yeah, that game was something else. M moving on to our next question. This comes from Alan T. Yoder. Other than the actual games, what is your favorite part of attending food, entertainment, all that good stuff? Another really fun question here. Honestly, I love the hibachi place outside of section 104, 105 for food. That is probably the best place to get food in the arena. I know you have permanis there. I know you have the typical chicken tenders. You have the burgers, all that stuff. But in my opinion, the best place for food at PPG Paints Arena is the hibachi place right outside of section 104, 105 in the lower bowl. I absolutely love that food. Entertainment wise, I mean, seeing Iceberg, screw around is hilarious he's probably one of the funnier mascots around the nhl but those are probably my two favorite things from going to games and you know just hearing a bunch of weird people doing the woo because that <laughs> always triggers me in a way but it's also just kind of funny <laughs> uh it's really hard for me to pick because well first off let me give uh, a shout out to one of my colleagues at kdka who is stepping aside from Penguins game day. And that's Selena Pompiani. She's not going to be the in arena host uh, because she is her and her husband, Mac are just about to welcome their first child. Uh, but, you know, hard worker, great person did such a good job as the in arena host and in, in everything she did for the Penguins. But for picking my favorite part, as much as I, you know, write my, as much as I write a column about the team and try to be an analyst and do all this on the, on locked on, I'm still at my core a fan and I just, I absolutely love everything about a game day. Like I I'm going to be 70 years old at a game and I'm still going to get goosebumps and get all pumped up during the opening video. I'm still going to, you know, when the, when Ryan mill does the intros and Crosby starts, I'm always going to shout along with it. it. It's just, I love the atmosphere around a hockey game. It's just everything about it, it. It makes it so much fun and just, it's the best live entertainment product in pro sports. So it's so hard for me to pick what my favorite is. Plus, you know, I grew up as a middle-class working class kid. So going to games was a rarity. It wasn't like I had season tickets. I'd get to go to maybe one or two a year. So I still always have that special feeling that, Hey, I get, I get to go to a pens game tonight. And it's just, it's the most fun. And Pat, can we just take a second to say, how great Ryan Mill has been since taking over for John Barbaro because it takes a lot to follow a legend like him. And Ryan has brought his own voice to the Penguins and he has been nothing but spectacular since taking over as the PA announcer. I think he's tremendous. Agreed. Uh, the best thing he did was he didn't try to be John. He didn't try to be a carbon copy of him. He found his own voice. He carved out his own niche. And it, it's a very good follow-up. I know at first he was a little rough around the edges. But one, you follow a legend. How are you not going to be? And two, it's a brand new voice. So people aren't used to it right away. So especially after someone who had been there for decades. So I think he has done a really good job. Plus... He's a great voiceover guy. I mean, I'll, I'll watch in the room all the time. And the guy, like at this point, the guy could read me bedtime stories. And I'd be like, this is awesome. <laughs> it's almost like, like to the point where I would, I would want this guy to just come over and like narrate a part of my life because <laughs> it would sound so interesting. He's that good. And his Crosby goal calls are awesome. His Evgeny Malkin goal calls, I think are my personal favorites. I oh think yeah. He has that down to a T and I'll never forget during the 2016 Stanley Cup final game five against the Sharks when the Penguins scored those flurry of goals in the arena and everyone outside was going crazy. And he took his time to announce it, waited for the crowd to settle down a bit, and then he just let it rip. And I'm like, he knows exactly what he's doing. He has been awesome 
since taking and that, over. For and that's huge. That's huge for PA announcers and just broadcasters in general. Sometimes you just got to let the arena and the game tell the story. Exactly. And I think he's definitely one of the best in the league at it. Finishing up this part one of the opening up the mailbag. This comes from one of your, you know, someone DM'd you on Instagram, Pat. Alex slid, Shaler. Slid on in them DMs. Yes. I, anyone wants to do that, you can follow me on Instagram, though I only mainly just post pictures of me and my lady. So that's all that I really post there. But um, this comes from Alex Shaler. Is it Pat? Is that his name? So that would be my that would be my pronunciation. If we're wrong, Alex, shoot me a message and we'll get it right next time. Have to just make sure. I gotta <laughs> gotta do it. But this final question: What are your all-time favorite Penguins jerseys? Mine, the OG diagonal Penguin. I I love it. Don't care if people say it looks like the Rangers. Whatever. You know, I think that's a hot take. I think it's a tremendous jersey. They had the OG one, I think is better than the reverse retro one. I have both jerseys sitting in my closet, just a diagonal outside my door here. I love both of them. I like the OG one a bit better, but everything about it is just so awesome. I always have a little bit of nostalgia for that video with Snoop Dogg, even though that was before my time. I still absolutely love that jersey. If I had to pick a second, like a close second, I'm going to go with the Robo Penguin. I know people will say it's cursed. I know they missed the playoffs this past year. Wasn't because of the Robo Penguin people. Uh, <laughs> I will say I did. I, I am a, I am one of the people who believes that it's a knockoff of the Rangers, but that's how deep that rivalry was in the nineties that they literally were going to copy the Jersey. <laughs> but uh, I will say this about it. I liked it when they brought it back for the reverse retro. I like the way those colors popped a little bit better. I also will say when they brought it back again this year or two years ago, whenever it was, I like the fact that like with modern jerseys, they tightened it up. So it looked better because Pittsburgh is such a long word that like, it's not great for a diagonal name, but my favorite is right behind me and not just the uncle Pat one shout out to you, DJ and the boys for that one. But, uh, it's just such a classic Jersey. Everything about it works. It's the best logo they have. It's the best color scheme they have. And you know, why fix what isn't broken? I I think part of the reason I have such a disdain for the robo penguin isn't so much because of the dark ages of the nineties and early two thousands. It's because they won back to back Stanley cups and completely changed their brand. Like why, <laughs> why fix what isn't broken? But at the, it, I'd say a close second to me is a Robo Penguin jersey. It's the late 90s, early 2000s alternate with the gradient across the middle. Right. Like that jersey is just mm, – like it captures that era perfectly, and it still looks good, man. Like if they would have done something for that this past season as the reverse retro or alternate or whatever it was, whatever they were branding it, oh, man, I would have been first in line outside of Penn's gear to buy that one. I feel like the Penguins, for the most part, have always had some of the best jerseys in the league. And their current home one is fantastic. Remember, that was one of the alternates to the – what was what was the last jersey? Oh, it was the Vegas gold. That was the one I'm looking the for. The sand-colored jerseys. Yes, the Vegas gold. It was all-black home jerseys. And I wasn't that big of a fan of them. I understood why people liked them, but it just wasn't – it just didn't feel like the Penguins, Pat. That's why I think of what I'm trying to say. The, the best description I have for those Reebok Edge jerseys is bland. That's just, They were just – they weren't great. They weren't bad. They were just there. Yeah. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. I just didn't like those you – know, those black home jerseys, Vegas gold, what, what, whatever you want to say for it. I just didn't really like it that much. Their away jerseys were kind of meant too, but once they made the change to the alternate – home jerseys at the time and now they're they're regular home jerseys i loved it and then you know you have the jersey behind you there are current road jerseys i think those are one of the best road jerseys in the league in my opinion the, just everything about them works they're aesthetically pleasing all the colors complement each other well and just again we're we're all sports fans that means we're nostalgia freaks so why not and and, and to your point about them having some of the best jerseys uh, they overdid it in the early two or the mid two thousands, but the initial winter classic powder blues, just 
Oh, perfect. I was never a fan of those. Just didn't I didn't I couldn't get into it. I if they bring back a blue jersey, I'm going to be upset. I'll yeah, say it. It, it just it doesn't fit anymore. No. It's it's not it, I liked it as a novelty and then they overdid it. They just wore them too often. Just, you know, during those winter classic, even the first one in 08 and then after that as well. I think and then they also wore them during the regular season. And I'm just like, okay, this is a little overkill. Can we just go back to the home and away jersey at the time, which really weren't that much better, but I could tolerate them a little bit more than those ones. <laughs> but I think that'll do it for this special edition of the Locked on Penguins podcast. Pat, I think we're going to have to do a part two on Monday because we have some really good questions that we haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, man. Look uh, look behind the scenes for our, our listeners and viewers here. Hunter and I were worried. We were like, man, it's it's late August. Like, we've kind of covered everything there is to cover in the off season. Are, are there going to be questions? And then you guys delivered, man. Yeah, you guys asked some insane questions. We only got to close to half, I think, for today's episode. We're going to try to get the rest of the second half for the Monday edition of the show. So, again, thank you all so much for listening to slash watching this episode of the podcast. We'll be back with part two of the mailbag on Monday.